Hey, everybody. I just want to say thank you very much for coming to day two of Android Summit. I know that uh, uh, coming to two days of conferences in a row is sometimes long, also lots of fun, hopefully. Um, but I, again, wanted to say thank you for coming um, and being with us. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce Don Felker. Uh, he is our kickoff keynote for the second day. Uh, he's going to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is quality. And all of you on the um, uh, in the Capital One mobile team, which I know there's a lot, uh, we all love quality and are working really hard to get there. So um, he's going to share some knowledge on that. Um, uh, I guess uh, we will be having lunch as well. Uh, we will not have a reception this evening. Uh, one other um, item is within the app, you can actually thumbs up or thumbs down each of your sessions. We highly recommend you do that. Um, it's a great way to give feedback to our, um, to our um, awesome speakers. So, um, and that's about all I had. So I'll turn it over to Don. Thank you. Can you guys hear me in the back? Good? All right, great. So thanks for coming. Uh, thanks again for everybody here who's come to the Android Summit uh, Capital One, the Android Summit staff who's made all this kind of happen. It's been a great conference, so thank you guys for coming to today's talk. I know that the second day is sometimes people will have a long night on the first, so thanks for making it to the first talk of the second day. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about testing for success in the real world and what that kind of means to me. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk about today, uh, there's a good chance a lot of you aren't going to agree with it. Um, I have a different viewpoint on some of the testing stuff that that we have and some of the other guidance that's been put out by some of the other industry leaders out there. Uh, so first things first, if you don't know who I am, my name is, again, Don Felker. I'm the co-host of the Fragmented Podcast. We are an Android development podcast. If you'd like to learn about kind of all different types of things on Android from which is our latest episode on image loading, on a new image loading library, to RxJava, to uh, Kotlin, all kinds of stuff. My co-host and I, Kaushik Gopal, Every week, we try to release an episode on Monday. Um, I'm also the lead instructor at Caster.io, which is a mobile uh, training platform. So if you're interested in learning about maybe MVVM, MVI, MVP, anything like that, we have courses on all those topics. And actually, some of the instructors are here in the crowd who are also uh, presenters here as well. If you'd like to get a hold of me, the best way to do that's going to be through Twitter or Instagram. And my handle is just at Don Felker there. Uh, and then one last thing here. My kids have no idea what the heck I do, and they don't believe me that I stand on stage. So if you do take any pictures, could you please send them either to uh, Twitter or either Instagram or my email? I would really appreciate it so I can show my kids, look, I actually do stand on stage. I just don't disappear for three days and then randomly come back with a nice fluffy toy. <laughs> so what I want to first start off with is my history in testing. So I've been developing for close to 20 years now. And when I first started developing back in like around 1999, I didn't really know what a test was. I kind of had read online about, you know, you could write a test, but it seemed kind of weird to me, like, why would I write code to test code? How do I know that test code is right to test the code? And I, it just didn't make any sense to me. Um, and it was kind of one of those things of, if I wrote software, it would work on my box. And the software I was writing back then was a lot of web software. I did some early VB6 stuff, which is even kind of more clunky. But I really started out in the web. And the big thing was is I would just test it on my local machine. I'd hit refresh in the browser, and if it, it works, uh, it worked. You know, it was kind of a hit and refresh, and it works on my box type of thing. I didn't really know what any of the testing was. And back then in the web, if you were going to do any type of testing, you would have to kind of, if you were in JavaScript, you'd use like an alert. If you were in some type of if expression, you might say, hey, I'm in here. And all of a sudden, the alert would pop up, and you'd know that you were in this particular part of the if expression. There was no firebug. There was no Chrome developer tools. There was none of that kind of stuff back then. And a lot of uh, debuggers didn't even exist back uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s for a lot of the new technology that was coming out. Um, so there's a various different, you know, console.log, again, if you're going to be logging to JavaScript, if you're using .NET, you use response.write, which would write directly to the response stream. If you were using PHP, which I did a lot of back then, you say echo, say, hey, I'm in here. It helped you kind of just visually debug. And of course, if you're an Android, you use the log.d, so you can actually see it in the log. So there's actually good logging in Android, so we don't have to worry about actually writing content directly to the screen. So this was, you know, back in between about 1999 to 2000, to 2003. And around that time, I started working actually in the music industry. I owned a small record label for about seven years while also being a software engineer at another company. And we used to go on tour on all these big tours like Warp Tour and Lollapalooza and everything. 
And when you're in the music industry, you have you make a lot of connections, and it's all the network that you have. You have someone that you know that does T-shirts, someone that knows that does stickers. This guy knows someone in Dallas that can help you up with the show. This person knows this recording artist. You can get on tour with them. I had a unique talent. I could actually create websites, and it wasn't something that a lot of people did back then. And so I created one of the first tour routing applications uh, for a larger band. Uh, and what ended up happening is they started talking to other people. Long story short. I created a basically a logistics tour managing application that was used by Atlantic, Warner Brothers, DreamWorks, and a whole bunch of different artists inside of the music industry. Um, it was all PHB, MySQL based, and you're probably wondering why I'm, I'm talking about this because something very interesting happened when I built this. This was an example of kind of what the front end of this website might look like. Everything in red here is something that was driven from the database, with the header, the links, the images, Everything was driven from the database. And so this is the front end. The back end had us the entire you know, kind of content management system. This is before Web WordPress came out. Uh, WordPress came out later that year. And even then, WordPress was just very a basic blog. So in the back end, you could do your, uh, add in your tour dates or whatever. And we'd display it on the web page. And if you had your favorite band, you could go see when they're coming into town. And a lot of, uh, of the labels started using the software. Uh, and back then, uh, I really didn't know how to build any type of big box software, so I kind of copied the code all over the place, which was, you know, of course, not a great thing to do. Now, one of the things that I had inside of my code there for each one of those little red boxes was a connection. And inside this connection, I'd say, hey, I need to connect to MySQL and, I'd, you know, whatever that stuff was. And, and where the comment is there, I'd kind of perform some query to get the data I needed. But it, that piece of code was in a function or an include file used everywhere. Now, the problem is, well, if you take a look at the catch block here. One time I was building part of the software and I was changing something and something happened to the database. I don't remember what it was, but all of a sudden my page was just blank when I was developing. Of course, remember I was testing by hitting refresh and it was blank. So something was wrong and eventually I realized it was this little catch block here. I said, well, you know, what? I need to put something in there. And I was really frustrated at the time. I just wanted to get this done. And so what I did is I just plopped in, oh shit. That was literally why this is a true, 100% true story. I, I popped this in there, and I said, oh, great. And now all of a sudden, wherever I made a connection uh, or a connection failed, I'd get, oh, shit, on the screen. And so at that point in time, uh, I was able to see what the problem was. I fixed it. You know, oh, shit, went away. Everything is good. I'm able to do everything I need to do. I finally am able to launch the website. And at this point in time, everything is good. I have now released this software, 15, 17, 20 different uh, large music recording artists. And then what happens is about, fast forward about nine months later, I'm sitting at home doing some other contracting work. My phone rings, and it's a hip hop music producer guy that, that was well known. He says, yo, Dom, a website's covered in shit. It's not a look, good look, son. And uh, I didn't know what he's talking about. And we're missing an emoji here for some reason, but that's the emoji of just like, hmm, like scratching your face emoji. I said, well, let me see what's going on here. And so what I did is I said, well, let me pull up your, your website and see what's going on. He was right. <laughs> the website was definitely covered. And this is the first thing I said on the phone. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the problem was is I forgot to remove this. And this is a, <laughs> I left it there. It was live on 17, 18 different servers still running at that point in time, waiting for something to go wrong. And what happened is just the, I think someone had changed the password or the SQL, the, the MySQL server went down or whatever. And so that was possibly to run across all kinds of people. And so this is a, a popular website for a, a popular band and all kinds of people were seeing it. Thankfully, uh, I was able to fix it quickly. And of course, uh, because I didn't really have any tests or anything, I just patched it right there on the server. Just logged in SSH, updated the, updated the code, remember, because um, I just refreshed it to see if it fixed, and everything was fixed. Uh, and it kind of follows this whole little meme you've probably seen floating around, and that was definitely how I did everything back in the day. And at that point, I was done. Hey, cool. But then um, immediately after I had that happen, I noticed something pop up that I hadn't felt before inside of coding. I was always kind of one of those people that just developed something, got it out there, and I was like, hey, look what we did. This is kind of cool. But now, anytime I pushed out new code, I had this huge level of anxiety that would just kind of <laughs> pop up over me. Because I didn't know if I was going to make that mistake again. And so I could have lost a lot of business from that. Uh, and thankfully, the guy that, that we ran into this issue with, I was a friend with. And I'd be, you know, become very good friends with him. And so while he was very mad about having his website covered in shit, um, 
he understood and I got it fixed and everything was resolved really quickly and I was able to patch everything else before anybody knew about it. But then I started thinking about myself, I'm like what could I do to prevent this type of thing from happening again? And I started looking up like testing or anything like that. And this is right around 2003, 2004-ish. And this book was released in September of 2004 and I ran into this book. And this is Working Effectively with Legacy Code by Michael Feathers. This is a book that I recommend uh, everybody read. In fact, any teams that I run, I have every person on the team read this book and they have a copy of it. I still have this book sitting on my shelf behind me at my home office, um, namely because some of the chapters inside of there, uh, the, the titles of the chapters are like, this method is so big, I don't know how to fix it. Uh, I'm afraid to make a change because it'll break the app. Um, various different things. What I always advise people to do is just take a look at the app, uh, excuse me, take a look at the book and then look at the chapter names and you'll see all the different types of things that would apply to you. Now it really applies anytime you're developing an application. And one of the things that really resonate with me to this day is the, the wording in there that Michael used is that if it doesn't have a test, it's actually legacy code. So at that point in time, um, I started trying to write tests for everything and I moved on over into different technologies such as .NET and I did a lot of Ruby on Rails. And so I started using NUnit all over the place and Rhino Mox for Mox and Selenium for automation. And then of course we had Ruby, we had test unit and Capybara and stuff like that. Um, everything was good, I was happy. Like all of the kind of the anxiety at that point kind of went away. And then right around 2009, Android came out and I started developing apps for it. And I kind of went back to the basic way I did apps before. I would build the app, I would ship it, and all of a sudden get out there, zero tests whatsoever. Um, I had many apps that were part of the first thousand apps on the Android market, and this was back in the day when you could publish an application, go to the Android market when it was called that, go to the category that you released it in, and you could just basically see your app pop up literally within seconds of publishing it. Um, it was an amazing thing. You could publish an app, your app would just have thousands of installs super quickly because there was no apps out there really. So fast forward to that, I said, well, I kind of figured my way around all kinds of Android, even though it was a huge, big mess. I didn't really know what I was doing. The documentation wasn't really there yet. There wasn't much you know, in regards to education out there. Right around 2011, I was reached out by the single developer at Groupon, uh, and he said, hey, I need some help over here, and I had made a pull request on his uh, dependency injection library, which was the first one, which was actually RoboJuice, if anybody remembers that thing. And so I started working at uh, Groupon at that time, and when I started, there was zero tests. So my magical friend reappeared, um, and we didn't have any tests. We were a, you know, a funded company, and so I started thinking, like, how do I solve all of these problems that I'm having with all these types of anxiety? And what I, it came back to is my days back in .NET and Ruby on Rails and, and everything like that, and that was basically automated testing. I knew I needed to have proper automated testing to for all these different types of situations I could run into, so I didn't run into a situation like I had with all the record label stuff I was doing. So what I wanna talk about a little bit today is how you can use automated testing and the types of automated testing that you can use and perhaps the ones that are gonna give you the best bang for your buck, and that's where kind of some, a little bit of the controversy is. But before we can get down that road, I wanna talk a little bit about the different types of testing. Chet yesterday had a great slide at his afternoon um, keynote where he showed all the different types of testing. There's like 50 different boxes and it has you know, black box testing, and you have you know, penetration testing, and load testing, unit, integration, system, functional, end to end. And there's like 50 different terms, and if you go look them up online, you will find 50 different conflicting definitions of each one. Someone will call a unit test an integration test, someone will call it an integration unit, whatever. There's a ton of them. I'm just gonna focus on three, and I'll explain each one of them how I see them, because that's how I kind of vision a lot of the, the tests that I write on a day-to-day -day basis. Now the other thing you may have seen is actually this uh, pyramid here, this was re released uh, on the Google testing blog, and they call it the testing pyramid. And what the testing pyramid is basically saying, look, you need to have more unit tests, and then you should have a little bit smaller amount of integration tests, and then finally you do need some end-to-end -end tests, uh, but you shouldn't have that many. And the way it's really better described is here, this is a testing pyramid, basically saying, look, unit tests are faster, they're easier, they're more isolated, they're faster to write, they're quicker to run, et cetera. I'm not gonna disagree with any of that. That's 100% the truth. End-to-end -end tests are definitely slower to run. They require more integration. They're harder to build. They're harder to set up. They are more flaky and just take a lot more time in general. So the first one we're gonna talk about is unit testing. Now unit testing is usually best for different lower level components. So maybe they don't have other dependencies to do their job. Maybe you have built like a calculator application for whatever reason. 
that's easy to test. Usually you're not gonna have, you need the network for a calculator. You're not gonna need it or any other dependencies. You're kind of be doing arithmetic and so forth. Could be simple objects, POJOs, POCOs, which are plain old Kotlin objects, plain old Java objects. Maybe you have an, a mapper or an adapter that you're kind of want to test. I've put one value in, something else comes out the other side. Algorithms, uh, financial calculations, stuff like that. So here's an example of a test in Kotlin using JUnit 4 of what it might look like. And the reason I'm showing some code here, just so we kind of have an understanding of what it looks like. And so uh, we have a simple calculator and all this calculator does is have an add and we use the assert that, that syntax that's in JUnit 4.12 I believe or you can use assert J or any number of other assertion libraries to get that similar syntax. And all this really looks like behind the scenes is a simple calculator app and it maybe has a function and a bunch of other functions such as divide, multiply, et cetera. And of course we're using a single line expression here in Kotlin to kind of one line it here. Uh, the thing is that to note, there's no outside integrations, no systems that it's talking to, it just kind of has its own independent. It's kind of, the calculator class is independent. It's very easy to test in isolation. Now another example of this might actually be if I wanted to unit test something like, like I said, like a mapper before. So I have a customer data model that comes from some backend system, but my view needs to use a view model and it only needs the full name and the int for whatever reason. So I need to be able to take this customer and turn it into a customer view model and maybe I need to do that all over in my app for whatever reason. And so maybe I've created some type of mapper that looks like this. And so you could use the interface or not, whatever. But the bottom part there is a customer view model mapper and all it does is takes in a customer and it returns a view model. Pretty simple stuff, just use string interpolation, we return back uh, a mapper. Now, the reason why this is in a different class is maybe because I know, that, again, I'm going to be using it all over my application so I'd like to test that I'm actually getting the data back that I would like. And so if I were to write a unit test for this, I might write it like this. I'd say create my customer, then I would create my, my mapper, and so I'm using, the, again, the interface with the types and, and so forth, and I'd say in the middle, hey, mapper, give me uh, my view model that I would like, and then at that point, I just assert that I got the correct full name and age. This is all kind of typical unit you know, testing stuff that we've seen. Now, one thing I'd like to mention here is you see how I have certain spacing in there? That is because I typically follow and promote what's known as the arrange act assert method of testing, meaning that you're going to arrange all of the setup of your test at the top. So that's when I'm setting up the customer, I'm setting up the mapper, I'm getting my test ready to be in a state that I'm ready to perform some type of action. Then I'm gonna act, so that means I'm gonna perform the act of what I'm going to be testing, which is where I'm actually gonna perform the mapping. And then the assertion down at the bottom, that's where I'm gonna perform my assertion. So anytime I write tests, I'll always do the arrange act assert. The other popular one, and, that, and there's a guy named Bill Wake who came up with the arrange act assert. You can also come up with, the, uh, use another one which is popular, which is the given when then syntax, which is kind of behavioral driven design syntax. Um, and there's a lot of systems like Cucumber and so forth that, that use this type of given when then type of nomenclature. I don't prefer that. The reason why a lot of people do like that is because they say they can give a document to their product owner, say, look, here's all these tests that ran. That's just a text file that says you ran tests. Who knows if it actually ran anything or did anything? Um, and I find that the, a lot of those systems are kind of difficult and cumbersome to set up and just cause more problems than not. So I just prefer to stick with something simple like the arrange act assert. So let's talk about integration testing here. So, Integration testing is where we have, in my opinion, again, this is my opinion, is where we're gonna have two different classes or multiple classes talking to each other. They are integrating for whatever reason. So one class could be talking about, you know, I need to do a job, uh, get data, so I need to talk to another class, and those things are, are, are integrating together. Um, the thing that we need to worry about with, it, with integration tests is that we're kind of like in a hermetic environment, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, which means it's an isolated test. But let's take the example of like an order aggregator. Let's say you have a, a system and if you've been developing software, you've encountered this long enough where you have an, a legacy API that where you get data from, for whatever reason the V2, V3, V10 API is created, but you still need to talk to the old API, you can't get rid of it for whatever business reason, but you have to talk to the new one as well. So maybe you need to combine both these orders together into a list. So you kind of have like this, maybe this thing called an order aggregator. It takes in two different APIs, your legacy one and your new one gets the orders from both of those based upon maybe some user ID, and then it kind of combines them using the, um, the union, which actually returns you a set, so you gotta turn that back to a list. So this is what maybe your code looks like, and you need to write a test for this, and so you wanna verify that 
perhaps that you know, a couple of things, you are getting the orders from both your legacy API and your regular API. Now this is an integration test. We're integrating two different things together. And again, this is my, my opinion here. So the test might look something, so something like this. It's very, very simple. A lot of things going on in this test. Um, some of the things that uh, in the community people don't agree with a lot. And that's on the first couple of lines there. That's actually mocks. So a lot of people uh, are very, um, I guess you would say, um, against mocks. Uh, I am a fan of mocks just because they kind of do the job. You can use fakes if you'd like to. You can create your own test doubles if you'd like to. I'm using Makito here uh, and Nick Harmon's uh, Makito um, kind of add-on so it works for Kotlin a lot easier. And so I'm gonna create a mock of my, my two APIs and then I'm gonna create my uh, list of legacy orders and I'm basically saying, hey, using Makito, hey, whenever the legacy um, get orders call is made with any integer, I want you to return back these legacy orders. And I do the same thing for the, the, the new API. Hey, here's a list of different orders, you know, with the IDs of eight and nine. Anytime that API is called with any integer as the ID, I could specify the integer if I want to, return back all these new orders. And what this is doing is, is setting up this test with, you know, Makito is basically setting it up so anytime these methods are called, it'll return that data. I create my order aggregator and I pass those two APIs in. Now those are through the constructor, so it's using constructor injection, so if you're used to dependency injection or separating your dependencies or, you know, layers of your app, it's kind of familiar there. And so the order aggregator is integrated with two other systems here, the legacy and the regular API. At that point, I just tell the aggregator, hey, give me the orders for the ID of number 42. Again, we really don't care about the ID here. I just wanna make sure I get back these orders. And then I kind of perform my expectation, saying I wanna make sure that the orders I get back are the ones that I passed in, so I kind of union them together. And then I make sure that they're the same, and this test passed. Um, so this verifies that the values that I'm getting back from the actual aggregator are working. So it's actually verifying the values are coming back. But here's the thing is like, it's kind of a black box. We really don't know what the aggregator is doing. We have a business requirement that says, hey, we need to make sure that the legacy API is always called. So how would we actually verify that? Well, that's not being verified that way. And let's assume some developer came in and decided, hey, I'm doing some testing in my local environment and I need to kind of get rid of the legacy API for whatever reason because I'm testing something. They leave this in there on accident they commit the code and it's just returning a list of. Everything compiles just fine because it's still passing in the legacy API through the constructor uh, and everything looks good. For some reason, the test still passes. Maybe there's some logic in here that has changed as well. The test still passes. However, with an integration test, you can also, if you're using certain mocks or you've built it yourself, you can also do behavior style tests to ensure that your integrations are actually integrating using um, a behavior verification. So in this case, we're not verifying any data that's come back. I'm actually verifying, hey, I'm actually calling the new API and I'm calling the old API. And that's done right here. I'm setting up the mocks the same, setting up the aggregator the same. I'm not doing anything with the result here, so it just calls get the orders. And then here we say verify the legacy API, uh, get orders call is made with the number 42, and also verify that the API for the new API, get orders with the number 42 is called. Now for whatever reason, on this one back here, we have it commented out. Now that, this next test right here would fail because the legacy API is not called. It would say, hey, this verification has not been met. So we're actually verifying, we're meeting that business requirement of, hey, we're actually calling a legacy application. So now we go back and we fix it. This all looks good and of course we're all happy because we get to this nice little thing here. We all wanna see where the tests have passed. So which kind of brings us to the end here. Uh, and this is the one we're gonna talk about end to end or ETE. Some people call these functional, some people call them system. Um, who knows, I'm just gonna call them end to end here. Uh, and these tests are basically going to be driven right now by Espresso. So if you've written any Espresso tests, I'm gonna call those end to end tests. That's gonna exercise everything from the top to the bottom of your application. You're gonna go from the UI, we're gonna run through your business logic, we're gonna hit remote APIs, we're gonna hit services, we're gonna hit part of the Android system. If you're integrated with Bluetooth or the contact picker or anything like that, we're going to integrate with that. So it's gonna test everything from top to bottom. So what does a basic Espresso test look like? Again, JUnit 4, uh, very kind of simple stuff. We're using the Espresso mattress here. We're just finding if this was a login screen here, we wanna verify that I can log in. I type in a, user, a username, which is an email, a password, I hit the login button, and then at that point I wanna assert that some message shows up on the screen. Maybe I have like a kind of a, a view that pops in there. So now the thing with this test though that it does uh, that a lot of people would really discount and say, well, it's a simple test, who cares, I don't need that test. It actually does a whole bunch of stuff. A, we can launch the app 
B, we know that the screen loads, B, uh, we can enter values into the fields because maybe those fields were disabled before or they could have been disabled. We can actually type into the boxes and maybe if there's a text watcher that has invalid logic that maybe makes it bomb for whatever reason, that verifies it's still working. We verify the login button works. We verify maybe that if there's a email regex on side of your email thing that that's gonna work. Maybe it enables or disables the login button. So there's a whole bunch of things that could be going on behind the scenes for this simple test that this one test could, tech, could catch for you pretty easily. Now it does take, if it does break, it's going to take you some time to go and investigate it, but it's actually gonna prevent things, bad things from happening. And usually this is the first test I write at every single client that I go to if they don't have any espresso tests and it catches a lot of things that you would never expect. So now if we're gonna revisit the, <coughs> excuse me, the Google Pyramid testing advice here, they say we should do 70, 20, 10. Now the first time I read this, this post, um, it was, I didn't really kind of agree with it. And this, when we moved the um, presentation over to the new format, we lost the emoji, which was the thinking face again, apparently. PowerPoint doesn't like that. Um, and so the title of the, the, the blog post was just say no more to end-to-end -end tests. So I, here's where I, I kind of had a problem with this is because I have a kind of an inverted view on end-to-end -end tests because if you see me tweet about a lot of stuff about users, about usability of your app, about how stable your app is, you've heard me say these words a few times, is that your users don't care about your unit tests. In fact, they don't care about your integration tests. They don't even care about your end-to-end -end tests. They just care if your app works or not. <coughs> So what ends up happening is if your application doesn't work, well, you end up with a whole bunch of these. And I don't know if any of you have worked at a company that's had a whole bunch of these before, but digging out of a, of a pit of despair of a buried in one-star reviews is nearly impossible. And in fact, I've been a consultant at a few companies where we've actually had to declare package bankruptcy. I have no idea if this term is used anywhere else. I'm kind of just making this up on the fly. But essentially, it's where your app has so many one-star reviews that you can't get out of that. And this has happened many times when companies have brought me in and they say, hey, uh, we have an iOS app. It has great reviews. We've been featured in the App Store, but our Android app sucks. And uh, we've all been there, and they want, us, you know, they want you to make it look like iOS, but you have to talk them out of that. Um, and then you end up looking online at the Play Store at the app, and you're like, oh, this thing is terrible. It crashes like on startup, or as soon as I press a button, like this is horrendous. Um, and it's just riddled with one-star reviews. And so a few companies, uh, four or five that I've been with so far, have had this situation where they've been at like thousands of one-star reviews, and there's no, you know, they only had you know five, six thousand installs, and they needed to get out of that. And so what we ended up doing was actually just changing the application package name, publishing a brand new one where it was basically a blank slate went back to the old application, updated it, and said, hey, this application is no longer in use. I'm sure you've seen this other apps before. I'm like, I wonder why they did that. Probably because they had a bunch of one-star reviews they were trying to get out of. And they'll say, hey, you want to install our brand new application over here, and it takes you to the Play Store to install that new link. It's a very common pattern to escape, basically, when you're buried in one-star reviews. Now, <coughs> excuse me, the reason why the Google testing pyramid kind of had me scratching my head is because I wanted to, I view tests a lot differently. Um, and I think that even I should have left off the, the percentage signs here because I don't want to think in percentages, I want to think in weights. To me, I find that end-to-end -end tests are far more valuable than unit tests. And I've had this discussion with, a, with another guy in the Rails community by the name of Andrew Culver. And he's written a lot of apps out there for various startups and him and I both agree on this and he's a huge proponent of testing, but he also agrees. There's so much more value in my end-to-end -end tests. Yes, they are hard to write. And, oops, the 60-40 here that I'm putting is that 60%, it's not 60%, about 60, you know, if you're a split of uh, even weights, 60% of the time you should be putting the majority of, the, of your focus and weight on your end-to-end -end test. 40% of the time it could be unit and integration. So where are you gonna get the most bang for your buck? As I'm saying 60% of the time it's gonna be inside of end-to-end, 40% -end. of the time you're gonna be on unit and integration. Now I'm not saying that unit integ integration tests are not valuable, no, not at all. But what I am saying is, is that if you write a bunch of unit and integration tests and one or two end-to-end -end tests, you're probably gonna start your app and notice that your app crashes in various locations. And I've had many developers say, hey, well, my, I, have, I wrote all the tests for it and it should be fine. Like, no, you wrote all the tests underneath the hood, but wiring everything up top to the UI, that's where it matters because that's what the user's gonna use. And so that's why I feel that end-to-end -end tests are gonna be your most valuable test that you write in your application. Are they slow? Yes, they're slow. 
and we'll talk about some ways to speed that up in a little bit. Are they hard to write? Yeah, they're hard to write, and it's, it's difficult to work around certain situations, which we'll also, also talk about. But the main reason why I feel the end-to-end -end tests uh, are the most important tests that you can write is because these end-to-end -end tests emulate your real users. If you actually click a button, you enter text into a text view, and you swipe, you do whatever in your application, through an end-to-end -end test, you're simulating a real user. That's how they're gonna use your app. And you're gonna know right away if you broke something. At my clients, we have a lot of integration tests. We run them on every single PR. I'm talking thousands of them, every single PR we run them. Uh, and we have it down where we can be in a PR in 15 minutes and run these thousands of tests, and I'll show you how we do that. Um, now, everyone says, well, that's great, I would love to do that, but here's the problem. Most end-to-end -end tests are a huge trash fire um, because <laughs> They're difficult to set up, they're difficult to get right. How many here, by show of hands, have ever seen the error message, uh, no test found in test suite or something like that? All right. Just getting started with Nespresso sometimes can be difficult. So the real issue here ends up down here at the bottom. Um, the UI, we can kind of handle that with Espresso, like the majority of stuff's covered there. Uh, there's even libraries like Barista to kind of help with like some syntactic sugar on top of Espresso. If you haven't used it before, look up Barista and Espresso on Google. It's kind of a nice library where you can use all different types of uh, syntactic sugar. But the real issue comes here is when people start to say, well, I want to do an end-to-end test, but I have a, an API that sometimes goes down, or I use the Bluetooth APIs, or I use you know GPS or wireless or networking or something like that. I can't, or I use a contact picker, I can't test that out. If I have an emulator that starts up, there's no contacts in the contact picker. What do I do then? Um, that's a very real situation. So what ends up happening is people try to write these tests and they crash because the network goes down or whatever. And what you really want to do is make sure your, your tests are hermetic. So your tests should be reproducible over and over and over. And if we look at the definition of hermetic on Google, it's basically a seal or a closure of something that's complete and airtight, meaning that we shouldn't have any outside influence inside of that test. I should be able to run a test, repeatedly get the same exact result every single time. If I'm hitting the network, I'm not gonna get the same result every time. I may have a super fast network one day and everything goes great. The next day I may have a bunch of latency. I may be trying to run my tests in here on the conference Wi-Fi. It's probably not gonna work that well. It's just gonna not work and it's not gonna be reliable. Um, so you need to make sure that your test is hermetic. You can run inside of a, a nice, Kind of contained box. And so how do you make your test hermetic? You want to remove any of the outside influence that you can. So remove the network, remove your shared files. If you're writing the shared state in your test, which I was just talking to someone recently about this, you're going to run into problems because that shared state is going to cause problems into another test. You want to sanitize your testing environment. You want to kind of make sure each time you run a test, it's run in kind of this black box. And you want to create these repeatable test environments. And one of the best ways you can start doing this right out of the box is by using, you want to decouple your application via uh, some type of architecture. You could be using uh, MVI, MVVM, MVP, your own custom architecture, but you wanna start decoupling a lot of things. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that if you have your application and it's two activities and each activity is 8,000 lines long and you're doing your database management inside of there and you're contacting your API inside of there, that's gonna be really, really difficult to test. So you need to start breaking these things apart using proper you know, programming practices and so forth. But the one big one here that you'll want to, to rely on is, if, is dependency injection. If you're using dependency injection, it's gonna be a lot easier for you to test and replace and swap components for testability. And that's kind of was my huge buy-in on dependency injection. In fact, my first public speaking engagement was on dependency injection for .NET in 2006. Um, it was just something that I kind of ran across. And I said, this is really cool, like it makes my life so much easier. And it was simply for the testing aspect. And then later on I learned all the other benefits of it. But it's always kind of had this test first approach for me. Now I don't care what dependency injector you use, it doesn't matter if you use Dagger or Coin or Codeine or some custom one that you've written yourself. What it does is just helps you break apart your dependencies. And when you start breaking apart your dependencies in their own little blocks, it makes things a little bit easier to test. So, these are some of the difficult areas, not all of them by any means, but these are some of the very popular difficult areas to test when you're using end-to-end -end testing, such as remote APIs, Bluetooth, you have cameras, you have contact pickers, content resolvers. And people ask, well, what do I do when I have, I have Bluetooth or anything like that? Well, usually I'm gonna wrap it, and I'm just gonna call that like a delegate pattern. I'm gonna wrap it in some type of delegate, and so it's kind of wrapping the existing functionality uh, that I can actually mock out. I'm gonna have an interface for it, and then I'm gonna have an implementation for it, and for the real main, 
mainline code, and then I'm gonna have a test implementation that I can kind of fake out if I need to fake out part of the system here. And what I wanna do is I wanna show you an example here. This is an example in Java of using, if I wanna use a contact picker, after I've gone started the contact picker in my app, and I've selected the contact, I wanna get their name and their phone number. This is the code that will get you their name and their phone number. It's not perfect, it is what it is, but it works. It'll get you the name and the phone number, uh, and so forth. Now, if this is inside of my application, it's gonna be really hard for me to test this because it's right there inside of my activity. And if I need to actually be able to get some data into the content resolver or whatever, it's gonna be quite difficult. Again, missing emoji. Um, so one thing that we could do is actually kind of refactor this a little bit to kind of have a little bit of a data model. I say, hey, my contact's gonna have a name and a phone number. Uh, and then what I can do is I create an interface and I'm gonna create this, this is a delegate pattern. And I'm just calling this as a repository because I need to get a contact from somewhere and a repository pattern is a good use of that. Like, I don't know where it's from, I just need to get it. Uh, and I know I'm gonna have a URI of some sort. And so then what I do is I have this thing called content resolver delegate which just implements my interface. And all it is is basically all that code we just saw here uh, on that previous screen right here. Basically take all that code right there that's from the URI contact stuff and down and puts it right inside of here where it says blah, blah, blah. So that's where all of our stuff would be that talks directly to Android, gets the content resolver, et cetera. <clears throat> now what I could do also for testing is I could then create a, a basically a fake version of this. Now you, some people could say, well you could use a, a Rhino, you, know, you could use mocks or whatever to set this up inside of your end-to-end -end testing. I don't like to use mock objects inside of end-to-end -end testing. I like, to, I like to have full control of them. So I'll create like a fake repository. And since I'm using dependency injection, I can swap these out depending if it's on a release build or, or a test build or so forth. And here, I've just created a method called load contact. It allows me to pass in my contact and my test, and I'll show you how to do that in a second here. Um, and then at that point in time, what we could do is we could have on activity result look something like this, it'd be a single line. I'd pass in my contact repository through some type of dependency injection in my activity, I'd get the contact and I'd do whatever I wanna do with the contact. And this is usually built with some type of, if you're using a module like Dagger, it might look like this, I'd have a file where my content resolver module would be in my main line, and then I'd have a test content resolver module in my Android test. And I'd have to configure my dependency injection tool, whichever one you're using, to make sure that it's using the correct one for Android test uh, or your main line here. And here's what the test might look like here, is we have just the, we've injected, like of course we're gonna do some injection inside of our, our test. We're gonna inject the fake repository, and this is again gonna be end-to-end -end espresso test. And then inside of our test, we're actually gonna set up the URI. Because remember when you, in Android, when you select a contact picker from the, uh, a contact from the contact picker, it actually just sends you back a URI, it's saying hey, here's the URI of where this contact is at inside of the content resolver, you need to go look up the details yourself. So I get that, con that URI back. Um, here we're just setting up an empty one, like I really don't care what it is, it's just I need to make sure I have a URI. And then I'm using the, the Espresso Intense Library. Hands, show of hands, does anybody use the Espresso Intense Library? A few people, okay, for those who don't know what it does, basically allows you to mock out intents. Basically says, when this intent is fired, return this data as an activity result. When this intent is fired, do X, Y, and Z, and it's kind of programmable. So in this case, I'm basically saying, anytime the intent is fired with a a uh, action pick, re reply with his activity results. So as soon as I say start activity to make to start the contact picker, the intense testing library injects itself and says, hey, this matches here, here's the activity result for what we expect would have happened. Uh, then at that point, I've kind of set up an expected contact of what I expect to get back from our repository. I load that contact again, because we're using the fake one here, remember the fake one all the way at the top, and I can actually load it up. And then I'm gonna launch the activity. And now at this point in time, I'm just gonna Maybe I have a button on my screen. Maybe this is a, an application where I send a message to somebody. I click choose friend. At that point in time, it starts the Android contact picker. But since we're using the intense library, it intercepts it and says, hey, here's the URI that you want to send back. And then at that point, our repository is going to hop in because remember, back here, <coughs> since we're inside of Android test, we're going to be using the fake repository here. And then down at the bottom here, after we've We've performed click, the intense library has already injected itself, it's already come back. Now perhaps maybe I've updated the screen to say hey, you're gonna send a message to uh, Don Felker and it's gonna have the text send to prepended to it and the number is the number on the screen there. And so this allows me to create a test that's very hermetic that actually does remove 
um, a lot of the complexities maybe built in with Android. Now there is a, another option for this, and you're probably wondering, well, well that's done, you're kind of like removing part of the end-to-end -end system. You're right, I could actually manually write code to insert values into the content resolver. I have done this. Uh, it's brittle, it can break, um, it's very difficult, um, but it's also not possible for some different things like Bluetooth and various different components you may be working with where you need to maybe scan for devices. A lot of that stuff we've, I've abstracted out into libraries, or excuse me, into interfaces just so I can kind of get a list of, you know, Bluetooth devices or whatever. Um, it's kind of like one of those trade-offs. So if it's, is it okay to remove the system? That's something you're gonna have to decide on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. Um, so it does kind of let make it less end-to-end um, -end at the end of the day. <coughs> the key thing here is though, if you're using an end-to-end -end test, you should only be doing what I just showed you and let, if you absolutely have to. If you don't have to, if you can use, if your app uses shared preferences, write to the shared preferences, that, that's fine. It, it's in your app, write to the database, it's there, like you can clean that kind of stuff up pretty easily. It's when you kind of start hopping off and, and reaching into the operating system saying, hey, I need this certain condition to exist. I need to know when we have 400 Bluetooth devices, what that's gonna look like in our app, is it gonna crash our app? I need to know when this certain type of thing happens in the contact picker. If we have no contacts on contact picker, what do we do then? Um, you need to be able to make sure you simulate those things, and those things are hard to set up uh, and so forth. And a good rule of thumb is, is if it makes, if a component uh, or something like that makes your test flaky, it might be a good candidate to extract out. Now one of the big things that's always talked about here is removing the network uh, inside of your API, inside of your end-to-end -end test, because this is the biggest probably problem that most people have, is they just have a line of business app that talks to an API, pulls data down, shows something on the screen, they're not doing anything with Bluetooth or anything like that. So how do you remove uh, the network and why do you want to remove the network? The, well, the number one problem is because the network is completely unreliable. One second it might be up, even if you have a dedicated test server for it to hit, that may go, go down, you may have a problem with a router somewhere, all of a sudden the connection fails, your test fails, it's flaky, then you start losing confidence in your tests and that's the last thing that you want to do. So some of the tools that you can use to remove the network are going to be Mock Web Server. You have Wiremock, uh, Hoverfly, full disclosure, I've never used Hoverfly, I've only heard about it. And then of course you can kind of write your own custom mocks or fakes underneath the hood inside of the Android test folder to kind of mock things out. Uh, the, one, the two that I have used extensively are Mock Web Server and Wiremock. Both of these allow you to return exact results. If you're using OK HTTP, you can use uh, Mock Web Server and a request is made, you can have it return a certain JSON string or whatever back to you. You can build a disp custom dispatcher so you can match the URLs. Hey, if this URL is hit, then return this JSON. It's very programmable. Uh, so that's kind of what you get out of the box with web, Mock Web Server, is kind of a blatant canvas of like, we can intercept requests, you need to tell us everything to do. Uh, so it does offer you a lot of flexibility. The other option is also Wiremock, which basically runs as a little mini web server inside of your application, so as soon as a application request is made, Mock Web Server acts as your server and says, oh hey, you wanted to hit this URL? Cool, here's the JSON back that you told me to give you. Uh, with all of these, you can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, and what I mean by that is when you start mocking it out, you're actually removing that actually endpoint there with either Mock Web Server, Wire Mock, or Custom, uh, so forth. But the things that you can do with it, um, you can return your known responses. So if perhaps you have a list of customers, you, might, you can return an empty array, you can return back an HTTP response code of, hey, it's 400, 401 unauthorized. What happens with my app when it's a 302? What happens when we get a 500? These things are all test if you, hard to test if you don't have some type of lower level system down there that you can actually test these things out. You can test these very difficult HTTP scenarios. and allows you ultimately to make your tests hermetic. Now, if you're looking for some resources, uh, you'll find here on the wire mock is the eight Android uh, HB mocking examples. Sam is right here, hand. Sam's actually the one who wrote that right there. If you go to the wire mock page and you look up uh, Android wire mock, you'll actually be pointed right to Sam's blog post. So Sam is right there if you have questions. <laughs> um, then there's also mock web server, uh, which you, you can uh, learn all about. We have a course on, on caster.io uh, where Chuki Chan shows how to set up mock web server in your application, how to handle dispatchers and all kinds of stuff like that. And of course, you can always Google any of those. So I want to share, um, before we wrap up, I want to share some end-to-end -end heuristics that I like, you know, rules of thumb that I like to follow, how to stabilize, how to speed up your tests, et cetera. The number one thing is, of course, we've been talking about this for a while now, mock out any of the difficult testing areas, Bluetooth, contact picker, I'm not gonna get into that, so it's kind of a well-known there. 
This one is kind of a no-brainer in my opinion, but a lot of people are still amazed when I go to a client and they don't have a continuous integration server. This is still something I run into all the time. Use a continuous integration server. I don't care which one you use. If it's Bitrise, Nevercode, CircleCI, Travis, um, you know, Jenkins, whatever. I have the Firebase logo there. It's not really a continuous integration server. It's a test thing, but I'll get to that in a second. But use a CI server. Every time you push up your code, run your tests. At least be running your unit and integration tests. If your espresso tests take too long, have them run on a schedule, even if it's just nightly. And we'll talk about here in a second how to speed some of those things up. You wanna run your, your test inside of a kind of enclosed environment, and Android Test Orchestrator kind of helps you do that. It runs each of its tests in its own instrumentation instance, so it kind of limits the shared app state that you can modify, so you don't run into these weird issues where you have this global test state and you're modifying things and this test changes one thing and this test depends on it, now it breaks because this was changed. So Android Test Orchestrator helps out with that. Uh, and you can just look that up online there. And also the crashes are kind of kept isolated. So it only takes down its only, its only instance there. So use this on all of our tests. Uh, shard your tests. If you're not familiar with test sharding, it's where you take your tests and you shard it off across multiple different devices. This uh, is very, very useful. And I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit more and even more advanced like way to do this. Um, but it basically allows you to say you have 100 tests and it takes you an hour to run these 100 espresso tests. You can shard it across two devices, in theory, and it will then only take 30 minutes to run them if you're splitting 50 tests, and they take the same amount of time to run them both. So you can then cut your time down even more. And this is how you would do it. If you want to do it in ADB, you can fire off the ADB commands to do it. Um, if you want to do it via Gradle, you can also do it in Gradle. Just look up Android uh, testing and sharding on Google, and it'll come up. Uh, one of them comes up on the actual Android documentation. One of the other one comes up on Stack Overflow here. And I have the links if you're interested. Um, if you're using Firebase Test Lab, and if you are not, I highly recommend that you do take a look at this. Um, Firebase Test Lab is amazing because you can run on a, a huge farm of devices, and they have a humongous farm of devices. Uh, and then if you're using Firebase Test Lab, you can then use something called Flank, which is built by Test Armada, and that's a Test Armada logo there. And what it allows you to do is massively parallelize your tests on iOS and Android across various different devices. So it's built-in sharding. Uh, so what I can say is, hey, I would like each shard to take no longer than eight minutes to run or 15 minutes to run. And then what we'll do is Flank has this smart system built into it where it'll then look at all of your tests and say, okay, the first time it runs, it takes a long time because it has to see how long all your tests take. And then it saves a file. And what it does is it looks at that file and says, oh, okay, it looks like all these tests took this long and then it creates these automated buckets out of that. And so, okay, well, if you wanna make sure all of your stuff is done in under 15 minutes, uh, none of your tests should take longer than 15 minutes or whatever, we're gonna go ahead and shard off 200 devices every time we fire it up. So we'll run thousands and thousands of integration tests in 15 minutes because we just shard them out horizontally. And then at the end, Flank takes all the JUnit results, which is all your failures or successes, and brings them down to a one final file. Says, hey, here's your results. So very useful if you have a bunch of espresso tests. The thing is though, uh, Firebase Test Lab does cost money. So you're gonna kinda have to evaluate it. Are you gonna run this on every PR? Are you gonna run this every couple of hours? Are you gonna run this once a night? But it does allow you to speed up your, your testing quite a bit. So lastly here, uh, I wanna talk about just finding success. The first thing we get here is a lot of people come up to me and say, hey, and especially on the podcast when people write in, we don't, I don't have any tests, I don't know where to start, can you guys point me to a, one of your podcast episodes or an online tutorial? Or what, what should I even do? I don't even know where to start. And the first thing that I say, and Kaushik says on the podcast all the time, is you need to start with end-to-end -end tests. Start with a test that wraps everything. So even if your application, you can't use Mock Web Server, you don't know how to use it, you don't know how to use WireMock, you don't know how to do any of those things, start with a test right now that hits that real server that can verify your login. Eventually, you're gonna get to a point where that, of course, it's gonna break, it's gonna be kind of flaky and you need to know that, but now you know that that piece of your application is tested and then you can start refactoring it and introducing things like mock web server and wire mock and so forth. But start with end-to-end -end tests because it'll give you the most bang for your buck. Remember the login test I showed? It tests all different types of things. It tests the real world end user experience. This is also a quote, uh, a similar quote kind of adapted a little bit from uh, working effectively with legacy code. Uh, and basically is that 
each test that you have, think of like, uh, is like an island of safety and like an ocean of bugs. So if you're in an ocean and you have an island here, that means you're in a safe place. That's tested code. There's another island over there. That's tested code. That's tested code. And eventually, as you start building more tests, you start getting this large land mass of coverage of safety. It's a big safety net. So each, type, each time you think of a test, think of it as like growing that wider net of safety for you. And a lot of questions come up here. It's like, well, I'm talking about end-to-end -end tests a lot. I feel that end-to-end -end tests are more important. Uh, when should I write unit tests or integration tests? You should do it when you're test driving a feature because it forces good design. So I wanted to make sure that was very evident that I'm not discounting unit or integration tests. They are very important, especially when you're starting to build your application or building a new feature or refactoring. Start writing tests if you can. Start using them you know, with a test-driven mindset, which kind of comes into this next question of here, like, well, where does TDD fit into this whole cycle here? I've had a very like on and love hate relationship with TDD. I love the things that it can accomplish, uh, but sometimes I feel like I can't do it because a lot of the times I just don't know what I don't know when I'm developing. If I need to implement a feature, I need to develop something for a client. There's something that needs to be done, and I don't know how to do it yet. Perhaps I need to go learn coroutines, and I haven't done coroutines yet. How am I going to write a test for a coroutine if I've never written a coroutine? I don't know. And a lot of us uh, get into that weird situation. And so I always feel that if you can write TDD, well, then do it. That, it makes sense. I, I feel that TDD is like when you're perfectly in that flow state. Like you know just enough about the problem. You know how to implement it so you can start writing the test to do it. And it's kind of a natural flow state. If you're not there, it's not going to happen. In that case, go back and write the test later to cover it and refactor. So kind of the whole red-green refactor thing at that point. And the guiding target that I do want to leave you with is like, consider the weights here. Um, the, the Google testing pyramid had it 70, 20, 10 um, with the number of tests. And I didn't like how they focused the number of tests. Like, oh, 70% of your tests should be this. I feel that you should ask yourself, well, where am I getting the most bang for my buck? And in my opinion, you're going to get the best bang for your buck in end-to-end -end tests. And what, you know, where can you get those? How is it going to be inside of your app? It's going to be different for everybody. But consider that, hey, I'm going to find more value in an integration test. So, Kind of where do we go from here is I'm asking everyone just to try to adopt like a different end-to-end -end mindset because end-to-end -end tests do mimic the real-world usage, and real-world usage is your real users, and those are how people are going to interact with your application. And the real big thing that you're truly really trying to do here is remember this simple thing here is that your users don't care that your test pass. They don't care that any of your test pass. They just care that your application works. And so writing end-to-end -end tests verifies that your application does work from start to finish. Even if it's a given feature, it does verify that that feature works. Anytime I've written what I call a flow test, which is I start the application and I go through the entire flow of a feature, I'm super confident that it works. And I'm confident that when it breaks, something went wrong, I can go back. And most likely, it's going to be something that we did inside of the code and our end-to-end -end test caught it. And the reason why this is all important is because you're trying to avoid moments like this. They're embarrassing to you, embarrassing to your company, and so forth. Thank you for coming. I appreciate your time. We have a, we have a few minutes for uh, questions if anybody has any. We have well, mics. Have for <coughs> oh, not on. Try this one. Hey. Hey. So uh, I was just wondering, how do you go about testing live APIs? Live APIs? Yeah. Like what? I mean, can you like on your with your app? Like and testing end? your app actually hitting the server. Do you do that like before it goes to production or? Anything? Yeah, before it goes to production, of course. Yeah, there's usually on a lot of teams I'm with is either a QA team that's responsible for doing that. If I'm on a small startup. It's going to be the developers. Uh, very often, I mean, from the last few years now, when I develop a feature, I don't even touch the real API. All I need is a couple of things. I need the, if I'm talking to an API, I need what the response is going to look like. Tell me the JSON. You don't even have to tell me the endpoint address. Just tell me the JSON. Tell me what it looks like, and tell me if I need to send anything back and what that looks like. And then, of course, what the screens are going to look like. From that point forward, using uh, Wiremock or Mock Web Server, I can develop the entire application in isolation, kind of test driving it with some end-to-end -end tests and get it working. Uh, and then at that point, once I've kind of got that point working, 
I'll then fire it up and say, all right, now we know the real API endpoint, which is very useful if you've been in the situation where someone says, we're still working on the API, it's not ready yet, but you can go ahead and start development. That's always a very difficult situation. And so as long as you can get that kind of contract, I can start developing it, and then once I've gotten everything built out, I'll kind of then point it finally at that new endpoint URL, hit the endpoint, and without fail, there's always a few things that go wrong. Like, hey, they changed a variable name. Uh, this is not an array anymore, this is an object. And those are things you just have to find out when you get in there and you have to adjust your tests accordingly. But I do end up, at the end, hitting against a real uh, API endpoint. The other way that you can verify that this is correct is other services out there like uh, RunScope is one service that'll actually test your API endpoints. So you can actually verify that it's up and running. And you can actually write tests against that in JavaScript to say, hey, is this API returning the data I want? Because a lot of times people will change data behind the scenes and all of a sudden your app breaks, You're like what happened? It's like, oh, you removed this field. And if you have an automated test set up, you have to run scope, or even if you have Jenkins or a, uh, and you wrote a custom script to test that, you can do it. But we do test manually at the end. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Don, we're out of time, appreciate it. I think he'll uh, be here the rest of the yeah. day and uh, you can corner him at some point if you have any more questions. And thank you so much. We'll be starting in about 10 minutes uh, in the same rooms. We've got uh, two sessions going on, one here and one over there. And then of course we have our Flare workshop going on right now. And then there's another um, uh, app privacy uh, workshop later in the afternoon from actually the University of Maryland. So hope you guys come to that one. Thank you all very thank much. You.